In this video, we're going to talk about which primes divide a number that has a bunch of sevens in it. And the answer turns out to be quite surprising is pretty much almost all primes. So stay tuned for the answer and an interesting discussion afterward about how this plays a role in decimal representations of numbers. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar. This channel is dedicated to theorems and problems in mathematics all the way up to the end of undergraduate mathematics to prepare you through that entire road and to prepare you for the road beyond. Today we're going to talk about the question of which primes divide a number that contains a bunch of sevens in it. And the answer is quite interesting. It turns out to be almost all primes. So first, let's rule out a few possibilities. Um, so the number 2 doesn't divide this because 2 is even and this is an odd number. Um, and 5 doesn't divide this either. Multiples of 5 are end with either a 5 or a 0. Uh, so what about other primes? So let's pick a prime P that's not equal to 2 or 5 and analyze the situation. So we're looking for a number that has a bunch of 7s that potentially P divides. So it might be 7 or 77 or 777 or 7777, etc. But we don't know um, where we're going to actually find one. So what I'm going to do is, given this number P, I'm going to write down P of these. So I'll end with a number that has P digits in it. So we have exactly P numbers here. Okay. So if one of these numbers is a has p as a factor, then we're happy. p divides that. So what we'll do is assume for contradiction that's, that that's not the case. So if we were to divide each of these by p, we'd actually get some kind of remainder. So the remainder here might be something, the remainder here might be something else, something else, something else, etc., depending on what p is, and then something else here. Now, since we made the assumption that p doesn't divide any of these numbers, none of these remainders are 0. So these remainders are all strictly between 1 and p minus 1. Or actually, um, 1 and p minus 1 are options, but these remainders are definitely numbers in the set between 1 and p minus 1. Okay, so there's p minus 1 numbers here. And there's p remainders in total because we started with p different numbers. So that means one of these remainders has to repeat at least once. You can't have p numbers here that are all distinct if they're numbers between 1 and p minus 1. Okay, so the situation we have then is something like this. We'll pick like one of the smaller ones and then one of the bigger ones that have the same remainder when we divide by p. So the situation looks something like this. You have this bigger number with a bunch of 7s involved, and then another number with fewer 7s involved, and both of these have the same remainder when you divide by p. OK, cool. So if they have the same remainder when you divide by p, then it must be the case that when you subtract them, there, that difference has to be a multiple of p. But when you subtract these, you get something like 7, 7, 7, 7, and then a bunch of zeros. Okay, so p is going to divide some number that looks like this. However, this number is a number with a bunch of 7s in it times 10 to a power. We don't know what power, but we'll say 10 to the m because it ends in all these zeros. Now, since we've selected p to be a prime that's not 2 or 5, p divides the product of two things. It can't divide this because it's not 2 or 5, so then it must divide this. So we obtain actually a contradiction that p actually does divide one of these uh, numbers with a bunch of 7s in it. It's kind of a cool argument um, using this cascading list of numbers with 7s in order to prove that this prime p, that's not 2 or 5, has to divide a number like this. Now you can notice here that we can make an argument that's very similar if we change this from a bunch of 7s to something else. For example, if we change this to a bunch of 1s, 
we get the same phenomenon going on because um, if a prime is not two or five and it divided this product, um, then it would have to divide this number right over here. We can change it to a bunch of threes and we have the same phenomenon or a bunch of fives and we have the same phenomenon as well or a bunch of nines. I want to think about the nine situation. So if we look at a number that has a bunch of nines, then if P is a prime that doesn't divide two or five, then it has to be the case that P divides uh, this number right over here according to the same argument that we use for the number with all sevens. There's actually a different way you can prove this. Um, you can write this number as 10 to a power minus one. And so your goal is to find a power of M for which this prime P divides this quantity. And uh, Fermat's little theorem, which we actually established and proved in this video right over here, tells you that because um, this 10 is not, does not have P as a factor, because it's not two or five, um, that if you select M to be P minus one, that'll work. P will divide um, that quantity. Okay, but even if you didn't know from as little theorem, um, you don't need it. Uh, we can use the argument that we used before. Now, why is that helpful? Well, let's think about the following. Let's think about a number like one over seven. So seven divides some number that can be written as a bunch of nines. Um, so we can go searching for it. And actually, given our argument that we listed, it's going to have to be one of the seven numbers here. Um, okay, so it turns out that in this case, it's 9999999. And that is, has gives us a numerator of uh, 142857 if you actually do the division. And the decimal representation of this number is 0 0.142857 repeated. Right? And that's not a coincidence. It actually comes from this fact right over here. The reason being, if we let this number be x, if we multiply this number by 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you get 10 to the 6x is going to equal 142857, 0.142857, 142857, etc., um, which is adding in x itself. So if we rearrange this, this is, says 10 to the 6 minus 1, which is 999999 times x is 142857. Right, so the repeating decimal phenomenon that we see with fractions like these happen because of the fact that some multiple of 7 has this repeated 9s going on. Right, and we can do this with any prime that's uh, not 2 or 5. So for, for 1 half and 1 fifth themselves, um, we actually get terminating decimals, 0 0.5 and 0 0.2. This is the actual backbone of proving a general theorem about expanding fractions that says that a number has a terminating decimal representation precisely when in fraction form, if it's written, its denominator in lowest when it's written in lowest terms, its denominator looks something like this, a power of two times a power of five. And otherwise you get some repeated decimal expansion and that's coming from this. So I'm not proving that here, but I'm giving you the fundamentals of how you start to think about this. So a pretty cool phenomenon with primes and divisibility that allows you to extend to get a feeling for why decimal expansions either terminate or go on forever. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, definitely click the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel.